us today on what is the third of the British Ecological Society webinar series. Uh, we're very grateful for everyone's time. Um, you may appear that there are uh, some technical difficulties and some of our speakers may sound a little echoey, so please accept our apologies for this. Um, uh, if you have uh, any desire to have anything clarified, please could you let us know and we will make sure that we pass that information on. Um, these seminars are set up really to help people network and understand from people who have been through the run of the mill how to best get a footing in research, which you all know is a very competitive but very exciting and rewarding career. So I'm very grateful for our three speakers today and indeed Samina for setting up this webinar. So I don't want to labour too much on, on listening to me as the chair. I'd like to introduce our first speaker if I can, uh, which is uh, Nicola Randall. Uh, and she will be speaking today about considering a career in research. Dan, just one more thing, because we can't see you at all. There's a smudge on your own. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. No. Oh. Okay, thank you for, okay, for thank that, you Dan. For this is Nicola here. Nicola here. I'm, unfortunately, I'm I've got a problem with my webcam. my webcam. So, I have prepared a presentation. I hope everybody can see that. So, I'm going to be talking for the next 15 minutes about considering a career in research and particularly focusing on permanent contracts. So the first thing I wanted to do was to just clarify what we actually mean by a permanent contract. So really what we mean is an open-ended contract rather than a fixed-term contract. But the thing to be aware of is that if you have got a permanent contract, that still may be terminated through things such as redundancy. Obviously you have the option to resign, it may be through long-term illness, etc. So as far as academia goes, what does it actually mean to have a permanent contract? And it may mean different things in different organisations. So some contracts, you may be in a university organisation and you may be taken on a teaching only contract. Alternatively, you may be taken on as a research-only contract. But the majority of universities in the UK have a combination of both. And that balance varies greatly between institutions. I've just seen, um, just quickly, I've just seen some notes about Echo. Um, I'm sorry about that. I think we might be trying to sort it out. But please do type if you can't hear, understand what I'm saying, and I'll keep an eye on that. Okay, so as far as contracts go, oh, that seems a bit better. Um, you will have a. You will usually be expected to do teaching and research as part of an academic contract, but you'll also be expected to carry out numerous other tasks, probably depending on where you are. And these could include administration, um, su student supervision, and supervision as, of staff as you move up through and perhaps build up your own research groups. You'll be expected to sit on boards and committees. You'll be applying for funding and doing lots of peripheral work around those things and I'll go into those a little bit later. But really, really important before we start thinking about this, do you really want to become an academic? If you're after a permanent contract in research, the chances are you will probably be looking at becoming an academic. Why do you want to do that? What are your motivations? Do you love research? Really love it? Do you want to spend the rest of your life doing that? 
do you like the idea of interacting with students and watching students develop? Because if you've got a, a contract that also involves teaching or supervision of um, postgraduate students or even having junior staff working with you, part of your job will be helping other people develop their careers as well. And that can be wonderful, but you've got to really know that's what you want to do. And something to be aware of is that most PhD students actually do not become academics. So I've got some Royal Society figures um, which show that around 30% of PhD graduates go on to postdocs. And about 12% 12 12 actually end up in permanent positions. So you do need to be aware that in actual fact, you may at some point decide to take another career choice. But you will gain a lot of transferable skills that will help you to do that. However, if you've really got your heart set on a permanent research or academic contract, what can you do to improve your chances? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience first and how I got here. And then I'll go through some generic things that you can possibly do as well. <coughs> Okay, so my experience. Well, I don't think there is a typical way to get here. To be honest, I've been in my I've been in my position now for about seven years, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about how I got here. So the first thing is, I have I have a PhD. Almost all permanent research or teaching contracts, um, or combinations of both academic contracts, require a PhD. So, so I probably took a fairly typical route initially. I went to university, got my A-levels, I actually worked out for a year or two and then came back to did a degree and went on and did a PhD, which I guess is where most of you are now or your postgrad, um, postdoctoral, um, have got postdoctoral positions. While I did my PhD, I had, in, I had in my head that I might be quite interested in academia and staying in academia. And I actually took the opportunity of taking a teaching qualification, so a, a certificate in teaching higher education while I was a postgraduate student. And I really think if you get those sort of opportunities, do take them. Because a lot of universities now, teaching is important as well, as well as the research. Um, after I finished my PhD, I actually had a little bit of time out of science um, and I worked in industry and in the conservation industry. But I also worked, um, I did evening class teaching, I did technical writing, then I did some research assistant jobs and then I got a research fellowship. It was actually a really quite a high profile research fellowship. It was part time and it was fixed for two years. I was two months into that fellowship when I saw this full time lectureship. The fellowship was really exciting. It could potentially have led to all sorts of different things, but it was fixed. I saw the lectureship. It would have been a complete step into the unknown, but it was a permanent contract and I decided to take a risk and actually go for that. I was very lucky. I didn't think I got the job. There were a lot, a lot of people there far more experienced than me with a lot more experience, but I did. I got offered it. Again, I had a dilemma. Did I, do I carry on with the research fellowship doing something that's really exciting to me or do I take the lectureship, a complete step into the unknown? I knew that this lectureship would have quite a high teaching load. I was quite nervous about that. Anyway, I took the lectureship. Obviously, at some point, you all have this, these sort of decisions to make and it really is weighing up what you really want to do in the future, thinking about the now, but also thinking about the future. And I think whichever decision I'd made, I would have made that the right decision. But lectureships, permanent positions are actually quite few and far between. I think if you do get offered the opportunity for one, when you can, take it. Okay, so let's look a little bit more generically then. 
So if you're interested in a permanent academic contract, as I've already said, I really don't think there is a typical route. Some people may well follow a traditional route, go straight through degree, PhD, postdoc, perhaps another postdoc, maybe even another two or three postdocs, and eventually you may manage to get that permanent contract. Other people, I know a lot of people that have worked in industry and come back into academia. And that expands your, expands your, well, everything really. It gives you a lot of other experience, a lot of experience outside of academia. It gives you credibility with students. The fact that you've got experience of other life, other experience, business, whatever it might be. My experience was in ecology and conservation. But if you think that you, the academic career is the one you want to pursue from the start, there are some things you can do that may enhance your chances. The first one is probably obvious, and it's peer-reviewed publications. So with many, many academic research jobs, the really key thing that people will be looking at initially when they're looking at your CV is what papers have you written? Have they been published? How many citations do they have? How much interest? Is it a topical area? Does it support the position that you're applying for? It may be quite difficult to get really high profile single author publications when you're at an early stage of your career. So sometimes it's useful to look at who you can collaborate with. It's really good to have those publications where you're the sole author but at the same time, you may enhance that by trying to collaborate with other people. And it might be that you're one name in a list, but it still means you can add that to your publications. The other um, really key thing I would say is network, wherever you can. Who do you know? Do you know people that might a, be able to act as referees. Have you got people that are high profile that might consider you when they're thinking about research projects, as I said, that you might be able to be involved with? People that you know when you're going to interview panels. Do you know anybody in the institution? You might even know the people on the interview panel. The more you can get your name around, the better. Because in a good way, of course. So can you go to conferences? Sometimes that can be difficult if you're on a short-term fixed contract and there's fixed funding. But if you possibly can, apply for funding to go to conferences. Apply for funding um, either internally or often externally. There's external fun funding for early career researchers to attend conferences. And if you do go to a conference, if you possibly can, even if you don't have enough to talk about for, to give a, an oral presentation, try to give at the very least a poster just so you can get your work seen. How else can you collaborate? Are there other networks you can belong to? Online networks, of course. So they might be research networks, they might be wider networks like LinkedIn, that sort of thing. Be proactive. Take every opportunity you possibly can. Because that opportunity might not arise again, and you never know what opportunities lead, what Conversations might lead to something, where an opportunity that seems quite small, where it might lead. Because that small little job that you do might lead to a big research publication, or it might lead to a bigger research project, or it might lead to that permanent contract. So really take opportunities wherever you can. And I think, as I said earlier, I think in this day and age as well, teaching experience is probably really valuable if you're looking at going into an academic organisation as opposed to a purely research organisation, because it might just give you that edge. So I was very lucky. I had the opportunity, as I said, to have a actually gain a teaching qualification very early in my career. All universities now are beginning to put staff through teaching qualifications so that they can become members of the Higher Education Academy. Um, it goes in teaching and teaching um, 
people's qualifications, the percentage of staff that are in the higher education academy, um, the contact time with students, all these sorts of things universities now have to publish. And so teaching ability is important, as is the fact that you're, you're probably required to teach at some point. So can you do that internally? Can, if you're a PhD student, can you offer to do some demonstrating, perhaps? Um, can you do things externally? I actually went and worked. Um, I, I worked teaching in evening classes. You know, just gave me that little bit of extra experience. Afraid, Nicola, as well. So just to, to, to raise that, if I can. So if you can make some closing okay. statements, that would be really useful. All right. So very quickly, my experience. Typical day. There isn't one. These are all the different things I've done in the last month. You can see it's very varied. And really do consider, do you want that permanent academic contract? So there's some disadvantages on the left as you're looking at the screen, some advantages on the right. I love my job. Is this what you want to do? You can look at overseas jobs. There's a good website there that's got European jobs. And finally, my top tip is be sure that academia is really what you want. Seize the opportunities if they arise, because they may not come again. Thank you. Brilliant, Nicola. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you for keeping to time. I think some very wise words uh, and, and some experiences there to share, so I'm very, very grateful indeed. Uh, and we'll come back to you later with the, the questions as well, Nicola. So if I could invite the next speaker, please, which is Francesca, and she's going to be talking about moving from a temporary to a permanent research contract. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so actually, I'm talking about permanent contracts, but I don't actually have a permanent contract yet. Um, so I, I hope to get there very, very soon, and, and, I, and I'm very confident that I will. Um, but um, in this presentation, I will focus on well, what I think um, you need to do to get there, and what I have done to get there. And um, I'd just like to um, emphasize that I'm well, really talking about um, teach well not not talking about teaching focused jobs because of course permanent contracts can also be teaching focused and uh, lots of universities now actually make the division between more research focused staff and more teaching focused staff but I'm, I'm specifically talking about um, well research staff or well, a combination of research and teaching because you'll always always have to do some teaching obviously um, so um, well, a permanent contract has actually been um, a goal for me for a very, very long time, especially as you, well, you finish your PhD, you do a postdoc, and you do another postdoc, and these are generally relatively short-term contracts, so um, you sort of start to wonder when you will actually have that security um, and be able to settle down somewhere. Um, and actually, as I'm sort of coming further in my career, I wonder whether maybe it's not just a goal, it's also just a means of doing what you like doing most, um, which in my case is research. And I guess to sort of to get there, to get to that permanent contract and uh, to get that career in academia, it's really all about um, building your CV and becoming a leader in your field. Um, so I will start with my take home messages and I'll also <laughs> reiterate them at the end. Um, but really what I found that's really helped me is to really focus on my research and be wary of distractions. And that's, well, it sounds very black and white, but it's obviously there's some nuance there, which I'll hopefully touch upon in my presentation. But also something that's helped me immensely um, in making the right choices for me has been talking uh, to lots of people and listening to to their experiences and their advice and that's really been invaluable for me. Um, so where am I coming from? Um, a little bit of background about my sort of career tra trajectory. So I did my undergraduate and masters um, in Wageningen in the Netherlands and I also did my PhD there which was um, and the topic of soil biology, 
And after I'd finished my PhD, I moved on to uh, the UK. So I ended up in, in Lancaster um, for a postdoc position. And this was a postdoc position in a, a big European project, um, which was brilliant because instantly I had a I had a big network of people and um, there were lots of resources to do experiments and to use other people's expertise in these experiments so I was able to do big experiments um, for example so I, I work on soil so like analyzing the entire soil food web all the organisms in the soil is just something you can't do on your own so I was able to do big experiments and other people contribute to the analysis of lots of different things and I was able to actually bring it all together so I got some really really nice publications from that which just I've, I've never could have I never could have done that on my own or in a, in a smaller project um, so when that project finished I stayed in Lancaster and I did a second postdoc in another big European project and um, I only actually did that postdoc for one year because um, in that first year of my second postdoc, I applied for a faculty fellowship uh, at the University of Manchester, which is, um, well, basically, uh, it's a position that pays your salary and the university expects you to apply for uh, an external uh, research fellowship. Um, so basically, it, this was a, a six-year position, so not a permanent contract, and they expected me to bring in my own money and to pay my own salary, but also to be able to do my own research. And so I applied for a couple of fellowships, and in um, well, last year I got awarded a BBSSC David Phillips Fellowship, which I've just started uh, this January. So. And that's for five years, and that not only pays for my own salary, but also uh, for a postdoc and a technician and all uh, the research consumables and travel that I'm involved in my, in my research project. So that's where I'm coming from. Um, and um, I guess when you are sort of working towards a permanent contract or towards um, a career in academia, I guess... Um, it's important to keep in mind um, what employers are looking for. Um, so um, I guess employers, and we're, we're talking, we're really talking about research, obviously here. Employers are generally looking for someone who has potential and can be um, a future leader in their field. So they are looking for someone who will continue to publish um, high impact papers and obviously employers are thinking about uh, the REF um, which will take place again in another five years so they are looking for people who will actually have outputs in the form of publications um, but they're also looking for people obviously who will bring in research funding um, and uh, again, with REF in mind, it's not just about these things, it's also about actually having a wider impact with your research. Um, but this is quite often a bit more difficult to demonstrate, but that's definitely something that I'll also be looking at. Um, for REST, obviously, you'll have to do admin and teaching. And um, as I've been told, <laughs> someone who the students don't hate, so you have to be, well, capable of, of teaching and um, well, and, and enjoying it because otherwise you probably wouldn't be a very good teacher. So, um, well, how do you get there? Um, well, I, this is this is also reiterating uh, some of the things that Nicola said. Obviously, um, it's very important that you go out there, that you present your work, and that you go to conferences. You get involved in the in the wider research community either by uh, chairing or organizing sessions, organizing meetings, um, reviewing papers, um, joining editorial boards, um, but also uh, collaborating with uh, people, obviously. Um, so in in my case. Well, I did all these things, and something that I also did was actually I started up uh, a special interest group for the British Ecological Society. 
in, in my research field and although that wasn't really a strategic choice at the time, I just felt that there wasn't um, a special interest group um, from the British Ecological Society that was really well uh, about my field of research. So I, so I thought we need to have this so I will start it and in hindsight that's just massively um, well, made my name known um, in my field and in quite sort of a transformative way almost and I really didn't think about this when I started it but it has quite has a quite an effect um, and obviously publishing high quality papers is very important and it is important to get involved in um, projects and to collaborate with people but I guess as an early early career um, early stage career researcher you really need to be um, careful that you're not ending up in the middle of lots of papers because what's really important at this stage is that you lead studies uh, you are first author on papers and because basically this shows that you lead uh, things and you are not um, just someone who gets involved in lots of things so you don't don't really want to end up being seen as a as a jack of all trades basically you want to sort of to focus um on 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 basically on carving your niche and becoming known for something that is unique about you and uh, demonstrating that you are uh, a future leader in your field um so it's also important to start applying for grants and these can be big grants that uh, pay for your salary but also don't underestimate the effect of smaller grants like the uh, BES uh, small and large grants that mainly pay for consumables which can also have a transformative effect on your uh, career. Um, so this sounds like a lot and you have to do all these things um, but in the end it's very important to not get too distracted by getting involved in everything because in the end um, when you want a career in academia it is about doing your research and your research is your currency so um, I, I, w I went through a phase during which um, I got lots and lots of invitations and I went through a phase of saying yes to everything because it was all very exciting and then at some point you realize that you are busy and that you sort of need to really carefully think about um, say, about which things you say yes to um, and also although I wouldn't sort of want you to be too strategic uh, it's very good to think about what you will get out of it and to really think about what your core is and what you want to focus on and whether uh, the external things that you say yes to are really useful. So something that is very useful, for example, is being on a, on an editorial board. So this is something that benefits your own writing immensely, but it's also something that you can put on your CV and that you will be recognized for. So it's very good to, to, to do all these things, but um, you just have to be um, well, critical um, about the things you say yes to, basically. Um, so, coming back to grant applications, um, grants don't only allow you to do your research and, and give you the, the funds to do your research, but they also look very good on your CV because um, employers generally want you to uh, secure money and getting, the, getting money for your research is just getting more, more and more competitive and a, and a brilliant way to do this actually is um, applying for personal research grants and um, well obviously this is very competitive and you're very very likely to get rejected a lot um, so this is basically this is five years of applying for grants um, in my career and well I've been very lucky to be successful for 50 percent of the time but it took some stamina because I've applied for quite a lot before my first sort of successful application. So just keep trying and ask for advice and ask people to read your grant applications and, and make use of, of the experience and expertise of, of people. Talk to people on, on committees as well, or 
people on reviewing boards because they will know what brands are judged on. Um, so, a personal fellowship is a really good way to enter an organization. Um, so, um, well, basically, they show they are highly competitive and they are sort of aimed at uh, potential future leaders. Um, so they show that you have potential and that you are actually able to bring in funding. So this is very attractive to an employee also because they pay for your salary. So universities should be happy if you chose them as your host institution. And there's a range of these personal fellowships. And these are obviously um, mostly from, from the UK, but every country will have fellowships like this. Marie Curie is international. Um, but in the UK, there's the Royal Society University Research Fellowship, which is very, very prestigious, probably the most prestigious one. Um, and then, uh, then there are also BBSSC and NERC Research Fellowships. And um, well, I know in the Netherlands we have, there are similar um, similar fellowship schemes, and they are very competitive. But if you get them, it's it it both it, it's brilliant, basically. Um, Hi, Francesca. Sorry to inter interrupt. Can you start making your closing statements, please? Yeah. So, um, in my case, I got a BBSSC David Phillips Fellowship, and basically, that this gives me the freedom and money to do my own research. And it's for five years, so it really, actually, it almost sort of feels like a permanent contract. Uh, another good thing is that it really allows me to focus on my research and obviously I have to do my share of teaching and I enjoy teaching, uh, but I don't want it to interfere too much with setting my uh, research, setting up my research group and focusing on my research at this point in my career. So I don't actually have to do that much teaching and um, it will also very likely result in a permanent contract very soon, although not yet. Um, and it, but as I said, it almost sort of feels like a permanent contract. So I'm actually not in a rush to actually become underwritten. I'm, I'm really enjoying being, um, well, having the freedom to do to do what I like, basically. Um, so what I did, um, basically, it sounds like a lot. You have to balance all these things. But in the end, if you really enjoy doing research it's not that difficult actually you just do what you love <laughs> um, and something that's um, well it's helped me a lot is talking to a lot of people and asking for advice and so this has been through formal and informal mentors uh, for example i've been part of the bridge ecological society mentoring scheme for women which has been very useful um, but I guess you just need to pick a mix of different people and sort of um, use bits of their advice. And that, that's really helped me a lot. And something that's already been said is just being proactive and, and grabbing opportunities as they come along. Um, yeah, so again, my take home messages. So focus on your research and really think about um, what you say yes to and um, find and use a range of mentors and use use the use the advice that uh, suits you basically um yeah and then basically i have just reiterated what all these people have told me throughout the years so yeah <laughs> it's worked for me brilliant thank you francesca some very wise words indeed there um, we, we do stand on the back of giants, and it's really good to see this culture of sharing knowledge and information between different generations, and it's very gratifying to see. Um, so our next speaker will be Sarah Dalrymple, and she's going to be talking about her experience of recently getting a permanent contract now. So whenever you're ready, Sarah, that would be brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so the first thing to say is that um, I normally work uh, flexible week or condensed week, so Monday to Thursday. And Friday's my regular day at home. Uh, so the kids, I'm at home and the kids are here and my mum and my grandma are all here. So if you can hear lots of noise in the background, there's several generations of the family around. So um, I was hoping Samina would be able to load my 
presentation. Um, is that possible, Simona? Oh, here it comes. Right, great. Okay. So the first thing to say is um, I'm a lecturer in conservation ecology at Liverpool John Moores University, and um, I've been there since May 2013, but that also involved a period of about eight months on maternity leave. Um, so I'm, so I'm fairly new to a permanent contract, but it's actually not my first one. And the first permanent contract I got was as a teaching fellow at Aberdeen University. Um, and that was a teaching only contract. Started as a fixed term sort of one year thing. And then they um, made me permanent. And that was linked to the core funding that Aberdeen got through their teaching. So that's an important consideration about when you're thinking about um, teaching versus research, all the stuff that Francesca was saying about bringing your own funding in, that's often true for research um, uh, contracts. But for teaching contracts, if your teaching is linked to core teaching at your institution, and that teaching is um, it's forecast to go on into the long term, you know, you're teaching on like maybe sort of general biology degrees or whatever, it is, um, then that means that you can get permanent contracts teaching only. Okay. And you don't have to justify your own existence to the grant bodies, which is quite nice. But um, of course, that means you get less time to um, less time to actually do any research. And when I was at Aberdeen, I worked very, very hard. So you know, sort of 60, 70 hour weeks to get everything in to make sure I did all my contractual teaching, but then also kept the research going. You know, at the same time. So. So that's my background. I also did a postdoc um, at Bangor in between Aberdeen and then coming to Liverpool John Walls. So I was asked to talk about um, what it's like now I've got my permanent contract. And so I thought I would put, um, it was going to be a very brief summary of my role and then it started getting really wordy. So I'm not going to read all of it. Um, but there's a thing to pull out here. I, I have four module leaderships, which means I'm running four modules, that's quite a lot. Um, I also have tutorials for all years, I um, supervise research projects, um, an undergraduate, we're set up a new MSc course and one of my module leaderships is running a placement coordination, so I've got an employability act as well. Um, I got my postgrad certificate in higher education, uh, the equivalent to what Nicola was talking about earlier um, at Aberdeen. And it's true that Nicola, what Nicola was saying, where a lot of universities are expecting it. So at John Moores, they're expecting that 100% of their staff will have a postgrad certificate in higher education um, in the next few years. And that's going to be a sort of a thing where they aim at. So if you're a new member of staff and you haven't already got it, they will immediately enrol you in it. So you'd be expected to get your PG Cert 80, um, you know, pretty quickly after getting the permanent contract. So I've got um, I've got research. Um, my niche is in plant re reintroductions and plant conservation, um, and I've done policy sort of stuff linked to that as well. So that's really exciting because um, we get to work on lots of aspects of uh, conservation, and I get to work with lots of people all over the world. So I've got collaborators in the US, Italy, China, all over. And um, so sometimes the time zone communication can be quite problematic. <laughs> Um, again, reiterating some things that Francesca said about professional activities where I'm on the British Ecological Society Conservation Special Interest Group. Uh, I do peer review. I'm on the BES Review College. I'm on the Board of Directors for the Society for Conservation Biology's Europe section. And I'm also in the Species Survival Commission for the IUCN. So there's quite a lot of stuff, again, working with people all over the world. Uh, it's quite difficult to juggle. And then the final, and it's really not the least, not last, but it's last but not least, is um, all the admin that I have to do that is linked to teaching and research. And I think this is the, probably the biggest shock that people have when they're coming from, you know, maybe a, a junior postdoc or even straight from PhD if, if you manage to get some sort of permanent contract. The amount of admin that you have to do just sucks in such a lot of time. Um, so, as well as sort of curriculum development and monitoring student progression through their assessments and the pastoral care and all those sorts of fairly obvious things, uh, also have to manage all the off-site logistics when we're doing field trips, 
to the health and safety, equality and diversity awareness. You have to manage your own workload, make sure the timetabling fits, you know, etc, 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 etc. And every time you take something new on, so if you sit on a committee for employability and activities, it's less time for everything else. Okay. <laughs> so not to be all doom and gloom, but it is really hard to do. So um, this is what I was asked to talk about by the yes, how I found out about the post. Um, I was, I think, I think this post is advertised to jobs.ac.uk, and that's where most people go. Um, and I also had job alerts for a few different institutions that I wanted to watch particularly closely because they were in a two-hour commuter radius, basically, from where I live in Sheffield. And um, so the the badges that I put here. Nottingham, Trent, Sheffield, your University of Bolton and Liverpool John Wars. I got interviews at all those places before I was successful. And the interesting thing about the interviews is that I came away from most of them going, uh, I don't know how that went, I'm not sure, you know, I didn't have much feedback, so I couldn't really read the panel and that, that sort of thing. Liverpool John Moores, Celeste, sorry. Um, so a good interview um, happened to me at Liverpool, John Moores, and I came away and was really like, that went really well, that was really brilliant. So um, so that was, uh, you know, I rang my husband and, and straight away sort of said, I think that went really well and I, I really liked it here. So I sort of felt that I fit at Liverpool, John Moores. And it might have something to do with it being very similar to what I did my undergraduate, which was Bradford, and they had a very sort of similar emphasis on placements and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but whatever it was, it went really well compared to the other ones, which some of them were terrible. And um, and then I, and then I was awarded the job, and I wasn't that surprised actually when they came around. So. Okay, and what did the application process entail? This is fairly standard. So it's um it's probably if you're going for a similar job as a lecturer, it's I'd expect this sort of thing. You get an application form with a lengthy personal statement, and I use the personal statement to um, address every single little point in their job specification. Okay, and that's really, really important. I know it's quite standard advice from like careers advisors, whatever, but I think that's what made the difference for me getting interviews at uh, John Moores and all the other places. Um, and um, that helped, of course, because I was a teaching fellow and I had already run uh, the conservation degree at Aberdeen. So I had experience of the admin and how a university works and curriculum development and all that sort of thing. So it wasn't just lecturing or tutor tutorials or whatever. Um, I had to do a presentation, which in the, um, the advice they said, um, pitch it as if it was a lecture for second year undergraduates. Um, but I did talk about my research, so although I made sure it was pitched appropriately, I still used it as an, a, um, a way of telling my potential new employers about my research earlier and, and all the things that I was saying about, you know, having done the policy off work and uh, off spins and, and things like that. So if you get that sort of invite, then that, that's my best advice. Use it to do both things, show how you can communicate at that level, but also use it as a way of, of, of um, what Francesca was saying about carving your niche, so you're already carving your niche at, at presentation level. Now at John Moores I was really impressed because I got um, a quite a big, I mean it wasn't just me, it was all the candidates, but we got quite a big turnout for the presentations. So after the presentation I've got questions, just open questions from everyone in the room, um, and now I know that they're, they're all become my colleagues now. Um, so I got everything from as diverse as how do you convince undergraduates that learning about plants is valuable? Um, and luckily I had lots of experience doing residential field trips and things at Aberdeen. So I explained about maybe drawing in ethnobotany or you know all these different things that I would do. Um, and then the, the other questions from uh, the group were specific to my research, so they were asking about maybe the IUCN reintroductions policy work that I'd done or the, um, some of the analysis that I'd done. So it was more like sort of conference questioning, which you might expect if you're doing a conference presentation. 
Okay, and after that, oh, and I should say as well, they put me in a room with all the other candidates, which I think is quite standard now. So after that, I have to go back and just talk to my competitors, which is quite strange. But I think that's fairly normal because that's happened at a couple of other um, interviews that I've had. Um, so after all that, um, I had a panel interview, and they put a load of um, their course performers, so their summaries of the course content, put those in front of me and said, which of these can you teach on? And because being a teaching fellow, I'd done a really broad variety of teaching. I could say this, 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 not that. I can do this one maybe at first year, but you know, not at final year or masters or whatever. Um, and so it was quite specific. You know, they were very interested in what teaching I could deliver and how I could um, fit into the gap that they needed to deliver, both research-wise, but importantly at John Moore's uh, for teaching, because they really needed someone to do the um, plant ecology field trips, basically, plant ID. Okay, so I was asked by BES to talk about what they enjoy or the challenges, and I started writing my list working with students and autonomy over my workload. They're both really important to me and things I really value about my job. Uh, working with students is very rewarding, um, and you get sort of daily feedback from being able to help them and work their way through to, to graduation. And at, at the end of it, when you go to graduation, it's a, it's a really lovely day because you've really got to know them. Um, and autonomy for me, I suppose it's the same for, and, and I think it's the most um, attractive thing about academia is that although my line manager is technically looking, overseeing my work, he just lets me get on with it. And that's very standard in academia. So, you know, I've got a course which I've written from scratch and it suits my research interests. And that's the final year course. Um, I often do co conference organisations who are doing the big SCB uh, congress in Montpellier this or, um, summer, and that's fine as long as I fit the work in. You just go off and do it. So BS wanted me to talk about the challenges, and I realised it was the same list. <laughs> so um, working with students, that's a challenge um, because. You have to be responsive and reactive. And in today's culture where they pay tuition fees, you I've noticed because I've been teaching since you know in Scotland they didn't have tuition fees, so I've noticed the change. There's quite a culture of entitlement because they're paying a lot of money for their degree, but some of them I think forget that they're paying for the opportunity to study for their degree and they think that they're just paying for their degree. So it's the, it's the minority, I have to stress that, but the minority can be quite vocal and quite, can um, make the job at times quite uh, taxing. Um, and then the autonomy over the workload thing, again, it's just reiterating what Francesca was saying. There's not a lot of roles that you have to do um, in academia, um, and you choose what you take on, what research projects, how many students maybe you're going to um, take on. Uh, and so actually for me, it's not getting involved in everything. So I'm doing different things, outreach work, and policy work, and la 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 la, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this week, I try and work Monday to Thursday, as I was saying, and um, I try and work 12 hour days, Monday to Thursday. But then this week, I've had to come home and I've been emailing and marking and things in the evening as well. So it's just, um, that's my fault because I took on some projects that I need doing this week um, and, and, so, and the marking has to be done. So, so, that's, uh, so that's the challenge as well. Okay. Could I ask you just to, to make your closing statements if you can, Sarah, yeah, sure. in a couple of minutes? Um, so the final slide really before my top tip is uh, to improve your chances of landing the ideal academic job, try and get a really good job um, sorry, handle of what the job entails from someone that does the job already. And so we've been giving you a bit of an overview, but you know that sort of thing has helped. The application form, as I said earlier, has to deliver um, for the recruitment panel. You should give evidence of exactly what you are capable of doing that they've asked for. And be very, very specific. Um, and then think, where, if you get the interview in preparation, you can think where the job might take you and what you could offer beyond what they're asking. So one of the things, actually, with John Moores is that they didn't have a master's programme when I applied, but they're doing one now. And so the fact that I had master's teaching experience before 
means that I can help them develop. So what are you bringing, as well as your, obviously, your research portfolio, which is very important, but in terms of teaching as well, it might be quite useful to get my hands on that. So last but um, not least, my top tips. So be strategic. Um, so if you always say yes to the same thing, even when you know there's half of your time, you'll only have yourself to blame when you're unmotivated and stuck in a rut. So on that kind of thing, you actually get the permanent contract. Um, and if you're finding it difficult to choose what things to get involved in, imagine that you're writing a reference to yourself. So it's that exercise of sort of being separate to yourself and looking back at yourself. How do others perceive you? And um, so if you're trying to decide whether to um, get more involved in editorial work or conference organisation, whatever it is, and think, does that add to my CV? It often will if you haven't done it before. But don't just say yes to absolutely everything. Okay. Uh, and that's it. Uh, and that's it. Brilliant. Well, thank thank you very much indeed, Sarah. Again, some some really useful information, and thank you for sharing your experiences. It's important that we do this. Uh, and I, I ask everyone that's involved in this webinar, please do send through your questions. Uh, we can all read out questions, um, and uh, we can address any questions you might have. Uh, a couple of things have, have come up that I'd like to raise with with uh, uh, the presenters, if I can. There's been some discussion. How, how do you make yourself um, sellable? How do you sell yourself if you don't have those papers? How do you get that foot on the ladder? What can you do to really help? So how would you crystallise that? So perhaps if I can start off with Nicola, how do you get that foot on the ladder? It's a very difficult thing. I don't think Nicola can um, uh, come in at the moment. So perhaps Francesca, would you mind just uh, chipping in there and just say, it is challenging without uh, any papers or anything like that. How do you get those papers in and how do you persuade people that you've got the potential to make the grade? Yeah, well, yeah, it's well, it's very important to have papers, and actually, um, that's important. Whether you go for a teaching job or a research job, you 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 need um, papers generally, I would think. But um, I guess people don't expect you to have loads of high impact papers when you're coming out of your PhD or when you're only just doing your first postdoc. Uh, people are aware of career stages. Um, I guess. You just have to show that you you have potential, and um, yeah, no one expects you to have uh, nature and science papers. I think, although obviously it would help. Um, but I guess um, also what we've just been chatting about, it's uh, a, doing a postdoc is probably the best way of uh, getting papers out because that's the time where you have the experience from your PhD and where you can really focus on. Uh, publishing papers and doing the research and you don't have all the distractions that you will have when you have a permanent job so you have very little admin and very little teaching that you need to do so you can focus completely on your research while obviously also starting to um, become involved in uh, peer review and um, going to conferences and things like that um, but I do think that the papers come first and then uh, you can you can start applying for grants. But basically, the papers are the currency of, of research. Do you agree with that, Sarah? Is, is that your your take on it as well? Uh, yeah, I think so. And um, when I um, graduated my PhD, I uh, only had. Um, I think I had one paper that was sort of in review at the time when I graduated, so I only got one directly out of my PhD. Um, but I would, I don't think there's any supervisors that would say that you couldn't publish from your PhD, and it's a good way of starting off. Um, and then, because I went into my teaching fellow contract, um, I have an idea for a research project, which I've actually done sort of piecemeal over um, the time since graduating. Um, so uh, it, it was based on reintroductions, and I'm actually doing the analysis of the, the thing that I envisaged is looking at um, how reintroductions um, can be used as a way of looking at climate change. So it's almost like a bioassay of climate change, but these, these reintroductions were done for conservation reasons, so it's like a different motivation. 
Um, but I started by doing uh, quite a big systematic review of reintroductions when I was early on in my teaching uh, fellowship. And then that got me invited to conferences. I've got more collaborators. They shared data with me, et cetera, et cetera. And now, well, what, uh, seven years on, I'm doing the analysis on that project that I first thought of back then. So on the way, I've just been getting little tiny bits of funding. The bills have been paid on the teaching board. And, and now we're just um, starting uh, to put in some big grant proposals based on the fact that this, this paper is almost, re almost ready, Easter holidays. <laughs> um, so mate, that, that is a route if, if you can't land yourself in a fellowship straight away. And the other thing about that is that also maybe the idea wasn't very fully formed when I first had it as a PhD student. So having this piecemeal approach has meant that I have actually improved it. You know, you can't measure how much I, but it's got collaborators on board. It's much stronger proposal now, even though the seed of the idea is still the same. Oh, brilliant. Thank, thank you, Sarah. And we've talked a lot about papers. I mean, how, how do our presenters feel about the quality of the journal that you're publishing in? And do you feel it's okay for early career researchers to be publishing quite low impact pay, pay, uh, low impact journals, or should they be pitching it high? What 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 advice could you give people? So, Francesca, do you have a, a view view on that at all? Um, I I think it's not fair to put uh, it's it wouldn't be fair for PhD supervisors to put huge pressure on PhD students to publish in high impact journals. And I do sense that most students do want to publish in high impact journals because they know that's what needed or that's what helps them in their career. But I guess as a PhD student, it you just need to make sure that you have some publications from your PhD. And obviously, it would be nice if they were high impact, but uh, I would just focus on getting them out in, in good journals and getting good papers out. And um, well, it depends on, on the results and it depends on how exciting the results are. So I guess you just have to be realistic. Most papers don't get published in Nature or Science, uh, actually very, very few. So, um, but. I mean, also people who look at CVs do realize that. And if you just show that you can, you can, you can write, you get, you get papers out. That's the most important thing um, is to show that you get papers out in respectable journals um, and people can, people can see that. Oh, th thank you, Francesca. Sarah, do, do you agree that the, the, the impact factor of your journal, when you're starting off in your career, isn't that important? It's actually getting some papers published and starting to build a name. Do you think that's the priority, really? Yeah, I think so. Because also, and it, it's going back to this idea that Francesca said about carving out your niche. If you publish in what, um, over the whole discipline, might be low impact, but it's well read by people in your area then that counts for a lot because again you, you're getting your name to the people that you might end up working with or employing you in the future so yeah i think that's yeah, a good advice no thank, thank you yeah, there I, is, i'm not there sure is if a, nicola sorry there is a balance between number of papers and and high impact papers and i guess it's best to sort of try to be sort of in the middle and don't carve up your research in lots of uh, small publications, but at the same time, don't steer yourself blind on really, really high impact publications. So if you have something that you can combine that makes it an, a nicer publication, then combine it rather than carving it up in lots of small papers. Brilliant, thank, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think a lot of the questions coming through are relating to what happens if I don't want to go into academia? Is there a research opportunity for me outside of, of universities? Now, I, I certainly belong to this field. Uh, I'm a, an applied ecologist. I work with a variety of different stakeholders. And I certainly see you can become a researcher outside of universities, but I'll, I'll be interested in Sarah and Francesca's and Nicola's view on this. Um, could they tell me any experiences they've had of working with people that are working within research outside explicitly higher education? education establishments. Maybe not. <laughs> I'm just... Certainly, there are lots, there are, 
lots of non-government organisations do have research mm -hmm. contracts and, and things like the Wildfowl and Wetland Trust, the Royal Society of Protection of Birds, they, they all have research positions. So don't just think that you can find a research career just within academia, although there's a very strong need to have a link with an academic institution, largely because it allows you to tap into research funding that you couldn't ordinarily access. Plus, it allows you to have these excellent networking opportunities but working with a non-government organization research thing does allow you to have some impact because they're often lobbying governments and policy makers. So th there are many ways up the mountain of research, really. And it's about choosing what you want and what is your value set as well. And I think that's also quite an important thing. Universities aren't the place for everyone. And, and that's perfectly fine. You shouldn't feel disadvantaged or anything. Try to find what works for you if you can. Um, and I think some people are also raising on the questions I'm seeing they're coming through here now is um, that how, how can people demonstrate their, their interactions and networking uh, within research networks if they're very early career? We've got a couple of people coming in who've done some brilliant work already uh, looking at setting up student led conferences and things like that. How can these individuals best present that information to have maximum impact? So Francesca, do you mind or should I go to Sarah? <laughs> Um, well, you can, you can highlight these things on your CV, definitely. So, um, on your CV you can have a section organising conferences and chairing sessions and, and just highlight your, your organising experience under there. And obviously you can, you can talk about that if you get an interview, you can highlight things like that. Yeah, so, um, so you could, uh, obviously the BES is an obvious place to start, um, and like me and Francesca and, and maybe Nicola as well, we're all members of BES and the special interest groups that relate to our research. So there'll be, um, I, I found anyway, the special interest groups are often very happy to have um, uh, the early career members get on board and help with conference organisation and that's a nice way in into a smaller conference um, where maybe you you can sort of feel your way a bit better um, and how it all works and meet people and that sort of thing. So if you find the BES or another, like you know, I talk about Society for Conservation Biology, um, I'm, I'm involved through there. So find your academic society and get involved that way. Um, and yeah, if you want to run your own student meetings, often part of the mission of those academic societies is to support early career members. So you're, if you're going to them and offering to organise a conference or some sort of symposium or something like that, you will often be basically helping them to deliver their mission. So I wouldn't worry about just sort of contacting people a bit out of the blue and asking about these sorts of opportunities because it is part of the central role of these academic societies to support younger members. So they will receive you quite favourably, I think they should do. <laughs> No, I think that's very, very wise, Sarah. I mean, obviously, we're the British Ecological Society, but there are lots and lots of organisations out there that you can tap into early career research grants, you can tap into conference grants, just have a go. Uh, it's actually fine to put down that you've had a go at something and failed, because you can use this as an illustration of how you've learned and reflected on your practice and improved, hopefully, to be successful in the next time. So don't worry about talking about failures if you can use them positively. It's very important you recognise that if you can. And when it comes to setting up conferences and things, if you've been involved in those things, try to recognise the breadth of skills that are actually in there as well. We often overlook what we call soft skills, like speaking with people, communicating, financial management, logistical arrangements. These are very important things. So almost try to create yourself a table or a matrix with what have you done and what skills have you actually used. That makes writing for your CV or your personal statement so much easier because you can actually evidence what you've done very, very clearly because most interview panels are looking for evidence of your achievements. So try to provide that evidence. It's really important. We're scientists. We like evidence. So give us evidence to use. Um, a lot of people are also coming in and talking about how they can get involved in editorial boards and grant reviewing. So do we have any advice uh, from the, the panel here about how to get involved in those things? It is challenging and it can take a lot of your personal time as well. So what, what, do, what does the panel think? 
Yeah. Well, I guess um, to be noticed by to to be asked to review papers, I guess generally people either recommend you. So, for example, when people ask me to review a paper and I can't make it or I can't do it or I'm too busy, I can suggest someone else. And I could, for example, suggest um, a PhD student or a postdoc that I think would be good to do the job. So that's one way of sort of getting into it. So you could ask your supervisor to maybe send uh, uh, recommend your name if you want to get into reviewing. Otherwise, generally, people notice you after you've published papers. And so they see that you've published papers in a, in a specific area that they are trying to find a reviewer for, and they might come across your name and um, ask you. And then, so that's generally, you, you need to have published papers, I would say, um, as a member of editorial board as well. To be a member of editorial boards generally yeah you are asked to, to sit on it uh, for a period of time and as a member of an editorial board what you do is you well you handle papers and you select reviewers and then you judge uh, those reviews and you make a decision together with a senior editor about the paper so you have to have some uh, already some reviewing experience, obviously, but also some publishing experience yourself. So that's generally for a bit um, the career stage. It's a bit later, I would say, after you've done a fair amount of reviewing already um, and published papers yourself as well. well. Brilliant advice there, really good. Anything to add to that, Sarah, at all? No, not really, other than um, on the side of grant reviewing, you can get involved in the DES um, uh, uh, review college. Again, maybe that's a little bit later. I'm not really sure. You, you could contact the um, DES grants officer, whose name I've forgotten now. It's not Becky, that's the person. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so um, she'll be on the website. And then. Um, you could offer to review grants, um, but it may be that you, you do need to, to, to have a little bit more career experience and keep out for that sort of thing. The only other thing I was going to add is that so, sometimes there are um, student and early career journals that you could help with reviewing, but I don't actually know of any that are directly in our, in our discipline. Um, so they tend to be um, institution specific journals that you could. And go to. Well, just to add to that, the, the, one one of the journals that is specifically targeting undergraduate masters is called Bio Horizons, and and I'd, I'd urge you to have a look at that. It's a forum for the presentation and the publication of work undertaken by undergraduates and, and master students. Each department can nominate a paper to submit to that journal. I think that's a very, very sensible thing. And there, I think there is also a new journal coming out specific for undergraduates in ecology as well. So have a look online, people. I think there's lots of opportunities out there. I wouldn't say the peer review is less robust. It's certainly robust. But obviously, we're here to encourage and nurture new talent to come through. So it's a great opportunity. A, a couple of my own undergraduates published from their own um, uh, undergraduate projects and they've gone on now and have got careers in universities so it can actually be a very very positive step forward so it's about getting involved and, and not being frightened to have a go and with regards to reviewing grants if you know anyone that's friendly within your department where you're, you're being taught you're doing research and you know they're involved in grant reviewing maybe ask them for some advice and maybe get them to go through some of the things they're talking about and looking at so you have almost like a mentorship that you can talk about in interviews and things like that so again reach out and talk to people we're all human we're here to help and when we've got time we will indeed so that's really great so and i'm just seeing from seminar our grants officer is amy everard of course we all know because i've received lots of emails from her this last week uh, and i think nicola has just come in as well to say that her, her her microphone is not working so if you do have any questions for nicola please do post them online for us and she will answer them through the chat function if we can so thank you so much for the questions so far. It, it, it's really good discussion going on. Um, is, there, is there any other advice you could, you could say, uh, guys, about getting involved? Is it about working with communities as well and maybe working with governments? We've talked about policy. How do you actually work in policy? How do you get the foot on the ladder for that particular thing? Because most universities are looking for impact. 
and impact is usually delivered through a policy change. How do we get people to, to recognise that and work in those fields? Well, the, the BS, well, the BS, BS is uh, yeah. 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 So if, if you if you if you would want to get more involved into policy, I think those would be um, an ideal way. I don't know if you know more about that, Dan. Um, I, I work a little bit with policy. It, it's about working with government organisations, and, and as ecologists, our, our discipline touches many other disciplines: uh, medicine, public health, geography, social sciences. Don't be afraid, in some senses, to talk to people outside of your discipline. And I think this is what we really need to encourage is this more cross-cutting, cross-working type approach to things. So if you know you've got a public health official and you're working on diseases, for example, or parasites or the loss of biodiversity and a driver of emergent disease, get in touch with public health. Make them aware that you have some skills and maybe something to offer. Uh, in Wales, we have Natural Resources Wales, which is a statutory body responsible for environmental stewardship. In each of your countries, you will have an environmental organisation, a government organisation. Start looking at their websites. They actually have funding. They actually have requests for feedback and stakeholder participation. Actually sign up and, and be active in consultations. You'll get your name across very, very quickly if you start to do that. Plus, you can see which way the wind is blowing as well. So that's also quite a good thing. And I think some of you, um, I think a lot of people are, are, are looking for mentors as well. I think this is something that I think the British Ecological Society might be able to talk about and, and arranging some form of mentoring scheme or something like that, because there seems to be quite a lot of people out there that seem to, to not have direct touch with, with a mentor. And I think this is something that perhaps we can all talk about as a community of, of practice to share and advise and encourage people. I, I think that would be really, really good to do. And it's something well, the, that we as an organisation can go away and talk about. Mentoring scheme for women, which I've, I don't know if they're doing it this year, but I've been been involved in it um, for two years. But it, well, that's for women. But. Uh, absolutely, uh, and, and women in science is a very important thing at the moment, uh, and we, we need to promote uh, inclusivity in all of our research and teaching activities. So that's very, very good to hear. Um, we certainly need to provide support as well but across the spectrum as well. I think there's room to grow and actually improve what we do as an ecological community in supporting other people. Because I, I wish I, I, I knew things now. I, I, I tell my students a lot of the mistakes I've made because I don't want them to make them because it's, it's not going to help them. So it's really important that we all share and, and are really honest with one another. I'm grateful for everyone's views so far. We've, we've got another couple of uh, uh, minutes of, of questions. So. Please do send them through if you've got any. It would be really, really good to have some more questions if we can. Uh, I'm just looking down there. Um, one question that came through um, with, um, was, can you be a leader without scientific papers? It's, it's actually a very good question, uh, particularly looking at the state of, uh, of the political state in Europe. Uh, it would be quite an interesting question to answer. So what, what do we feel? Can you be a leader without scientific papers? Can you make a name for yourself without that publication, particularly, let's say, with outside academia? A difficult question, I, I take it. Uh, it, it, it. It's one of those things which is hard. And my, my advice is really to get involved with report writing. A lot, there's a lot of grey literature out there. It's not necessarily peer reviewed, but government reports and feedback reports and consultations do count on your CV quite a lot, particularly if they're really aligned with your research and you can demonstrate that you're working with NGOs and governments to deliver real impact for societal gain. And I think don't be afraid of doing different things. We talk about papers as the currency. That's very, very important, very important. But there are many other ways that you can actually secure recognition uh, in your field. So it's about being creative. Uh, science is about individuality and solving problems. Solve the problem creatively if you can. Uh, and I think it's really important that you be empowered to do so. Um, so the policy connection within Wales, sorry, Tony's just come in, it's Natural Resources Wales. Uh, in England, it's English Nature. In Scotland, it's Scottish Natural Heritage. And there are public health, there's the Department of uh, Environment as well. So there's lots of different things out there that you can start looking at and getting involved in and make your, your views known.
in Swansea, we hold something called Science Cafe as well, and I think they're held throughout the UK as well. And you could indeed start one up where it's an opportunity to engage society with science. So if you haven't got a Science Cafe in your area, perhaps that's something you could do and set it up. And there is a site, if you go on, online and look for Science Cafe, you'll see their host website. So maybe you might, some of you want to consider setting up something like that, a facility, an opportunity for the dissemination and debate on science, which is certainly something I think we all agree is needed, uh, is very productive and helps society. Okay, I think we've, we've nearly uh, exhausted our, our questions there. I think, so we're nearly drawing the end uh, to this particular webinar, and, and I'd like to really thank our speakers again, and thank you very much, Nicola. I know it's been very difficult for you not being able to contribute to the discussions just now. But I, I think some real wise words have been spoken here today, and I hope it's been very, very uh, useful for you all that have attended. Very, very grateful for everyone's contribution so far. And if I can just finish off with the key salient points here. So Nicola is really keen to make sure that you all understand that really, is academia for you? Is it the right path? And, and this sort of harkens back to what I was talking about value sets. If you don't like the idea of working 16 hour days, seven days a week, then maybe it may not be the role for you. It's horses for courses. So you make that choice and, and because it's important to be happy in whatever vocation and career you have. If you're happy, you can succeed. And that's very important. So if you're feeling miserable when you start out in academia, don't be afraid to go, hmm, this really isn't for me at the moment because you can return again. And I know lots of individuals that have left universities, gone out to work, got real life experience and come back again and have actually brought a greater insight to a broader spectrum of disciplines and understanding. So it can actually be an advent, it could be advantageous. Um, Francesca's fantastic uh, um, uh, summary here that she wanted me to raise is, it's important to get involved and you've got to get involved in your research community and it's what gets you noticed. And it's finding that, carving out that niche for yourself, which is a, a very good ecological term, I know. Uh, and find a range of formal and informal mentors or role models that can inspire you and provide that honest critique. You need honesty. You don't want someone to say to you, this is brilliant, this is brilliant, this is brilliant, if it's not. You want honesty, so you have to be able to take it. You have to be able to accept this criticism sometimes, which is difficult. We're all humans, we all have egos, it's hard. But it's for our benefit in the end. And, and Sarah really uh, typifies what we've been talking about today. It's about being strategic. Um, uh, it's something I can learn from really, not saying yes to everything. It, everything is brilliant. Ecology is wonderful. Nature is a marvelous thing. It all seems interesting, particularly when you're starting off in your career. Be very, very careful not to bite off too much because you might not be able to swallow it in the end. Better to focus, particularly in the early stages of your, your career, to make sure you're making as much impact in the early stages. That's when your name is start to, starting to grow, to mature. When you reach my ripe old age of about 103, then you could probably start to spread your wings and dabble in lots of different subjects. So do try to be um, um, uh, very, very focused in the early stages. So I'd like to thank our, our, our presenters again for their time. I hope this has been a very, very useful opportunity. Uh, and watch for us next year. There'll be another series of the British Ecological Society webinars. And we're very, very proud to, to host these. And we welcome the international community that have contributed to the discussions today. So many thanks indeed for your time, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the day and enjoy your weekends. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Brilliant. No problem. Bye now. <laughs>